This actually isn't a, a, an old slide. This is from uh, last week. This is out of Swedish. That's uh, Charles doing an operation there with John, <laughs> telling the patient what's about to happen. And uh, I'm doing the intraoperative monitoring, and you can see how bored I am. Um, but yeah, that's that's part of the reason the staff went on strike, is to help uh, get us some new. Uh, I noticed that that is an awake uh, dominant hemisphere surgery. So. <laughs> well, I'm glad you, know, you knew that that was what we were doing, Charles. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're going to review risks for seizure in patients with brain tumor. We're going to discuss management strategies in a few cases. And um, this slide might be patronizing for some of you here. By the way, who is actually here? Do we, can I get a show of hands who's uh, in nursing or ENRP or uh, uh, fellowship training for nurse surgery? Uh, and then neurosurgeons and then neurologists. Uh, and Anyone else I missed? Industry folks? Um, okay, gives me a beat on, on who we're talking to. So, uh, obviously, in brain tumors, histology becomes pathology, and there's a maturational arrest or change that drives proliferation depending on the time of change. And uh, the question for, for us in epilepsy really is. Uh, twofold, how does the maturation change and the proliferation change make seizure more likely? And I think today, later on, you'll, you'll hear from Dr. Kassari and Henson in their breakout session, at least in terms of genetic factors, but that's where I wanted to kick off because as we get more and more involved in genetic screening, we're le learning more and more about our epilepsy patients' uh, genetic risks, and as you are about your brain tumor patients' genetic risks for progression. I've listed a few of the common ones that might be familiar to you, but you can see there's aspects of uh, outcomes and survival based on uh, the, in the oligodendroglioma population. There's uh, defects in NMDA glutamate neurotransmitter relationships that might trigger seizures. There's problems with DNA methylation, um, uh, endothelial growth factor expressions, glucose receptor issues. And in the tumors that we see a lot of in our epilepsy clinic in the neurofibromatosis and tuberous sclerosis patients, uh, more specifically, we can really start peeling back and looking, looking to see how complex those chain relationships are. So I'm going to warn you in advance, the next slide is uh, what ought to be titled the slide, meaning everyone gets one circular shaped slide with a million things on it. <laughs> um, and there it is. And I'm going to explain this in uh, monotone. Uh, this is, uh, <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a a depiction of some of the protein kinase pathways of mTOR. So mammalian target of rapamycin is one of the key uh, issues or problems in tuberous sclerosis along with gene defects in the TSC1 and TSC2 genes that provoke a variety of uh, maturation pathways to develop tubers, tumors, systemic tumors, inflammation, etc. So from from my point of view, it's not necessarily just the additional cells that form tumor that's important. Uh, like Dr. Um, Okada's talk just previously, it's actually way more likely if there are inflammatory or autoimmune or immune changes for us to see seizure activity. Uh, so inflammation for me is one of the key things in trying to understand why the tumor is hard to treat and targets for treating it. So here, for instance, is one of my patients I've been following since 2008 with tuberous sclerosis. And the classic abnormality there for the uh, neurosurgical fellows is this guy here, the subependymal giant cell astrocytoma, uh, sitting at the base of the lateral ventricles, tends to grow, tends to block the foramen of Monroe. It's the issue of blockage of the foramen of Monroe that leads to the clinical compromise of hydrocephalus that can cause that de devastating effects. And for years, you know, they might have targeted this with, say, gamma knife or surgical therapies. But uh, in the last decade, it's really been the mTOR inhibitors, rapamycin, serolimus, everolimus. This patient went to Cincinnati for their trial and was treated sequentially with everolimus with 
two things notable. One is the size change of the Sega, and the second is the seizure frequency improved markedly. Um, so independent of genes, what about the macro environment? Where, where does the tumor start? Where's the spark factory? Where's the neuronal dysfunction? And does that play a role in making epileptogenesis more likely? So here's two uh, tumor scenarios. You have one with some ill-defined white matter problem close to rolandic or premotor, and the second with an amygdala enlargement. You can see it best in comparison to the contralateral left side. The amygdala is juicy and fat. So which one of those is more likely to trigger seizures? This one in white matter probably isn't going to do much. It's this guy sitting immediately in front of the hippocampus, which is prone to using a ton of glucose, a ton of energy, has a lot of connectivity throughout uh, frontal, temporal, parietal, etc. It's this guy that's going to be way more likely to trigger seizure. So in thinking about tumor progression, for us, for me specifically, knowing where the tumor starts uh, knowing how the seizure starts, if they overlap, it can point us towards areas that we want to pay particular attention to, such that if we know uh, it's close to a potent generator, we know that it might kindle that activity or cause uh, major issues long-term with seizure control that are extremely hard to treat. So I grew up in Canberra and Australia. This is from yesterday. Uh, the kindling that's going on there in the forest there is exaggerated by the ongoing drought, the location, the hills, the forest type, etc. It's the anatomy of the place that predisposes towards the severity of the seizure. Okay, so remember, we're talking about that other, this is that other example of that peri uh white matter change, but over the course of 12 months, the horror uh, just goes on and on. You have a massive expansion from glioblastoma. So we talk about seizure control and seizure provocation. Normally, it's the cortex, the very edge, the gray matter that triggers seizures. But when you get a guy like this, the inhibitory controls that come up from other locations, like the thalamus and the locus ceruleus, are often undercut or eroded or ruined such that seizure activity that begins on the cortex can't be effectively given a signal to slow or calm. Within that kind of horror, uh, there's obviously things going on, hypoxia, acidosis, um, thromboembolic effects, DVT risks, and so on. Next, there can be gluco uh, uh, neurotransmitter imbalances, particularly between GABA and glutamate. So a lot of work going on in this. Uh, glutamate regulation and tumor growth can be corrupted leading to issues on glutamate receptors, calcium influx, apoptosis, all of that milieu of excitatory actions makes seizure activity more likely. And this gets really useful to know because in the last few years, there are glutamate antagonists for glioma and epilepsy treatment, specifically the parampanel or ficompa is now on the market. It's been on the market for four or five years. And in trials and studies that are small, but interesting, some of those uh, tumor sizes have regressed a little bit while on parampanel therapy, along with better seizure control. Parampanel is not uh, a gift of a drug, though. It's a tricky drug to get a hold of. It's expensive. Our staff spends hours trying to get this approved in patients. It's got mood-associated issues. It causes weight gain. If you eat a lot of it, you might get high, supposedly, but most people can't afford to do that. Um, and it's not, at least in my pantheon, of great or good anti-seizure medications. It'll be curious to see, though, over time, should we be adding in a low dose of this where it is tolerable, what happens with our patients who, like Dr. Okada was mentioning, really need a multi-pronged approach to hit the tumor to best treat it? Shouldn't we be thinking about things that are additionally useful? So back to that horrible growth. So a blood-brain barrier permeability makes seizure activity different. Um, swelling impacts the ability to deliver medications to the 
edge or penumbra of the tumor, tumor site that typically is the most active in these large tumors. Uh, and that kind of growth or swelling is best addressed either with debulking or diuretics or steroid therapy. So these next series of slides um, I find kind of boring, but um, nevertheless, this is the sort of stuff if you are uh, going for your boards and certification and so forth, you need to know this. Uh, tumor types and seizure risks. I find this kind of boring because it doesn't really matter to me when I see the patient what type of tumor it is because we're gonna go to a therapy of any sort and it's sort of um, these kind of numbers, 60 to 95%, 30 to 60%, they're not betting numbers. They're not either super high or super low. They're just right in the middle. The only one that's super high is that DNET or disembryoplastic neuroepithelial tumor. Uh, that one is extremely likely to trigger seizures. The age of onset tends to be young, males more than females, ganglioblomas, etc. You can see the breakdown of age of presentation um, it can take extradural tumors, including meningiomas, twice as often in females, um, more often presenting in the 50s. And then seizure types that present more with seizures are going to be primary gluomas, more than metastatic tumors. Okay, path versus epilepsy prevalence. I'm just going to let you read through that. Again, these aren't betting numbers. They're kind of all over the place. If we move forward though, is there a location? So for me, the location is way more interesting than the actual path. Is there a location or tumor that's more likely to generate seizure? So uh, locations, convexity or tentorial tumors, tumors that are perirolandic, tumors that are close to the hippy, hippocampus, tumors that involve swelling, those tend to be a little more provocative in my clinic for seizure control. Um, Otherwise, melanoma, hemorrhagic lesions, multiple metastases um, tend to be harder to treat. So management decisions. Uh, this is a Vermeer, and we think, or art historians think he's actually depicting Anthony, Anthony von Leeuwenhoek, the inventor of the microscope. So it's a little uh, shout out to the pathologists among us here with that depiction. So who in our workup, who needs an EEG? I kind of view the EEG as much as I'm an epilepsy specialist as, as sort of like a dowsing rod. It's a crude and very blunt tool that confirms your suspicions if you're lucky and otherwise it's almost a complete waste of time. But the, uh, I would argue that the, the regular EEG in uh, brain tumor presentation with seizure is seldom necessary if your semiology or the seizure description fits with the location of the imaging abnormality. So if you have an imaging abnormality in the Rolandic cortex and they show a classic contralateral body Jacksonian arch of seizure activity, it doesn't take someone all that bright to tell you that that's the seizure that started around your brain tumor, right? Uh, however, this, who needs video EEG in neuropsychology? In the slow growing tumors where the tumor might have induced or kindled a separate location to develop seizures, that's the group that is actually important to study and to study comprehensively because that group might have a tumor sitting in a location that doesn't match the semiology, that if you take the tumor out, you're stuck with the epilepsy. And that's heartbreaking for patients who are under the assumption that their presentation with seizure leading to a diagnosis of brain tumor, when you get the tumor out, they're gonna be seizure free, and that doesn't happen, that's really hard for them. So that's the group that we spend time and working out and making absolutely sure is the area where the seizure is generated from overlapping with the tumor? Uh, and if not, is it in tissue that we can take out successfully? What's the likely prognostic implications of intervening surgically? Who else needs video or EEG? So uh, postoperatively, we'll see fairly commonly, especially in the large tumor resections with a lot of swelling that folks don't wake up. That's a group that the EEG plays postoperatively to try and understand are they in subclinical status, or is there something going on there that does become important. And then we talked about low-grade gliomas and semiologies beyond the tumor site. <laughs>
I'm getting a weird error message up here, but uh, here we go. Okay. Surgery remains the best treatment for patients with tumors presenting with epilepsy. This paper um, by Mitch Berger and others um, is probably, again, sort of required reading for the neurosurgical fellows among you. Uh, it details the outcomes based on uh, how big the resection was with seizure control. In general, the take home is the bigger the resection, the better the epilepsy outcome. In uh, their surgical series, they uh, looked at things like electrocorticography, which is measuring brainwave activity intraoperatively, to see whether that had any impact on outcome for seizure freedom. They didn't really show it. So intraoperative recording, looking for zones of epileptogenesis, doesn't really change epilepsy outcomes. Post-surgery seizure freedom listed here. Again, not necessarily betting numbers, and then for your extra dural-ish meningiomas, the meningiomas being very common, a lot of us think of them as pretty easy to take out, but all of us who've done this for a while know that there's plenty of meningiomas that aren't easy, that grow rapidly, that dive down through the dura into uh, cortical tissue, and that actually are really problematic and uh, evocative for abnormal activity. That group, I've found typically it's the convexity sphenoid range parafalsine sort of folks tend to have the harder to control seizures. Okay, let's talk about medications. There's an alchemist mixing the meds there. Who gets anticonvulsant prophylaxis? So pre-op seizures, I don't think there's much argument that if you're presenting with seizure, you, pro you should be put on some form of anti uh, seizure medication. Uh, most of our surgeons tend to prophylax perioperatively with IV loads um, in folks who haven't presented with seizures with a gram of Kepler or so and maybe run them for a week or so and then kind of wean it back down. Um, the prophylaxis um, 10 years ago used to be Dilantin, but fortunately we've moved well away from that because Dilantin tends to be a tricky drug to use. It's easy to provoke hypersensitivity reactions like he's having here. And um, it does a lot with other enzymes in inducing them and triggering declines and things like chemo. It's a trickier drug to use. So most, um, I would assume, of our neurosurgical colleagues in the US at least probably use levetiracetam for their perioperative management. What they often do, though, in the levetiracetam is a fairly timid use of the milligram amount. It's OK to give 1.5 gram, 2 gram for an adult patient who you're a little bit worried about, especially if they've got a bunch of swelling, even though they haven't had seizures. I would argue it's better to do that than to give a, a tame dose of 500 milligrams or something. So choosing among the list of anti-seizure medicines for which one to prophylax is not an easy decision. There's a lot of side effects and curveballs to all these medicines. So um, we'll walk through a little bit on some of the drugs. So we've talked about Keppra uh, or Levetiracetam. That drug, if you are going to use it, long-term outpatient, the patient's not uh, able to wean from their meds postoperatively. That drug is much, 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 much better tolerated for mood side effects if you use the long-acting version. So if there's any take home today, if you're gonna use levetiracetam a lot, the longer-acting version might save you a lot of heartache and stress and depression and anxiety. It's a little hard to get right now. There is a national shortage. But that drug is, uh, in general, a smarter way to dose that long term. Let's talk about Depakote. Depakote's a dirty drug. It has a multitude of mechanisms of actions. Uh, it has a ton of side effects, weight gain, hair loss, acne. But it also has some intriguing, uh, somewhat not intuitive benefits. One is it might slow slightly the breakdown of chemotherapies that aren't temozolomide. The second, um, in some of the high-grade tumors, um, it may, especially with histone, deacetylase inhibition, it may slow some GVM regression. Um, it does predispose to thrombocytopenia and leukopenia, 
Uh, it does also predispose a little bit to platelet activation inhibition. So folks on Depakote tend to ooze, and that is a pro and a con. It's a con when you're operating. It's a pro when you're dealing with postoperative radiation necrosis or radiation narrowing where you need a little bit of blood thinner or blood effect to push more drug up into the penumbra around the tumor site. So Depakote may have some pros and cons with how it works on clotting. Um, weight gain, we talked about, especially if you're going to use steroids, tremor, hyperammonemia, triphasics. This is where it gets tricky. We'll sometimes add these in our status patients because status epilepticus in the trials, among the better drugs for status treatment isn't Keppra, it isn't Dilantin, it's actually Epicote. Uh, so we do use that in the unit quite a bit and uh, then end up chasing our tails a little with hyperammonemia and triphasic waves and so forth. We talked earlier about parenthenol, and we didn't talk much about um, making sure that your patients have some access to anxiolytics and emergency seizure benzodiazepines. So all of us have seen patients who are terrified of their scan, either going in to do it or coming into clinic to review the results. It's useful for them to have a little bit of lorazepam or clonazepam to use as necessary to kind of lower that stress. And if at home they're having back-to-back -back seizures and they call us to have to give an emergency, sometimes we can save ER visits and a whole lot of heartache by making sure that there is some um, benzodiazepine in the medicine cabinet at home. Clobazam, many of you may not be familiar with that drug, also known as Onfi, uh, is a uh, non-tolerance inducing uh, benzodiazepine. It's a long acting benzodiazepine. It's extraordinarily effective with motor predominant seizures. So you, you may see your epilepsy colleagues using this one. It doesn't tend to lose its efficacy over time, and it is a good drug in breaking motor predominant status epilepticus. So this last point, the slower the tumor grows, the better job you guys do in keeping people alive there's a really good chance they're gonna still need long-term anti-seizure treatment. So there's a lot of work we do trying to get our patients used to the idea of being on a med, what med, mitigating side effects, juggling the doses, uh, juggling expectations, driving certifications, autonomy issues. There's a lot of stuff that happens in our long-term tumor patients with seizure control that your epilepsy colleagues are probably pretty good at negotiating, adjusting, and uh, applying for your patients. So um, don't just call it good once they leave your clinic on levetiracetam. That's the circumstance where you're getting calls, they're not doing well, we're happy to see them. So should your other colleagues at your institutions who work with epilepsy patients. So when do you withdraw? Uh, this is a retired guideline, but nonetheless, um, talking about basically, what was it? First perioperative week is appropriate. Um, that guideline probably uh, is not as useful in the day and age of the non-enzyme inducing anti-seizure meds like levetiracetam, so it's, it's pretty out of date. And I'm not sure that it's well being all that well updated. Um, I, having been burned so many times about folks trying to withdraw from medications, I tend to keep people on low doses of a tolerable med long term, so long as it's not giving them uh, side effects. So let's go through, through some lessons learned the hard way, and feel free to tell me, John, how many minutes I got. <laughs> okay. Um, so here's our pre and post op nightmare presentation with a large tumor. Uh, with PLEDS. PLEDS is a epileptiform pattern that is a rhythmic. This um, chunk of time here is about eight seconds. Every big bolded yellow bar, which is a tiny bit hard to see as a second marker. These are focal epileptiform discharges of a cluster of neurons that keep firing. And they're not necessarily firing from the cortex. It's in fact more likely that these are probably coming down from the thalamus in trying to kickstart or get that area regular and going again and 
three means. All right. So PLEDS is a hard one. PLEDS is tricky to treat. It doesn't respond terribly well when we boost anti-seizure meds. The cost of boosting those seizure meds is sedation. When we see PLEDS, the way I like to think of it getting better isn't necessarily with the medicines. It's with whatever is blocking the thalamus to communicate with the cortex. Um, um, so how do you do that? One would be reducing vasogenic edema. Some of the anticonvulsants have a diuretic effect. Topamax and zonisamide have carbonic anhydrase functions to them. They do help pee out a little bit of volume. Um, some of the diuretics have an anticonvulsant effect. Bumex, for instance. Debulking might help. Um, the necrosis itself on the edge of the tumor may manifest different seizure types as the tumor progresses. So what started out is maybe that Jacksonian march, uh, when that Rolandic cortex dies in the heart of the tumor, turns into a different tumor type, maybe a, a sensory manifestation or a visual manifestation. So mood issues are near universal um, in large tumor folks. If you're going to use a mood stabilizer, please do not use Wellbutrin. It's on paper the most attractive one. It doesn't cause weight gain. It doesn't uh, have sexual dysfunctions. It is well tolerated, but for epilepsy risk, it magnifies that enormously. So I'll just do a brief run through on pediatric issues. So Pete's patients that were radiated years ago are curveballs for us. They can lead to vascular narrowings, uh, focal epilepsies, perfusion issues, where we go in and take tissue out, we get unanticipated ischemia because we weren't thinking about the radiation field narrowing arterial flows. So sometimes you, uh, I will ask our surgeons, is it okay if I use aspirin therapy in this patient, even though years ago uh, they were thought to be free of seizures or whatever, or they had their uh, tumor well taken care of? The aspirin therapy, just like in other strokes, does help deliver more drug to areas or numbers of ischemia. I'm gonna skip this slide. So prior radiation from hematologic malignancies might lead to later tumor growth. Uh, so for in our screening of tuberous sclerosis patients, for instance, we use MR instead of CT. Um, here's an example of uh, a falsine uh, meningioma with invasion into the brain and jeopardy or jeopardization of both venous drainage structures and arterial flows. And you can imagine that scenario is really provocative for seizure activity and making sure that the blood is moving up through there as best as possible to deliver the drug um, is, is required. He's doing great, by the way. I will tie things up with the rest of these, because these are just more clinical examples of badness, and uh, we may not need all the badness. <laughs> In any case, I, I wanted to leave some time for questions. Are there questions based on ideas about managing or understanding seizure control? Zach. Hey, Michael, thank you for a really great overview and or review. Um, I had two questions. One is, can you comment on the use of Lacosamide or Vimpat in these patients? Because I often see it added on as a second agent when they fail their first line therapy. And then the second question, uh, which I'll, I'll tack on after you answer that. Yeah, so Lacosamide is a slow sodium channel blocking drug. It's, it's a little more novel in its mechanism of action compared to the older sodium channel blocking drugs like uh, dilantin and trileptal and carbamazepine and things. Uh, Lacosamide side effects that make us a tiny bit jittery mainly involve slowing of some subtle cardiac conduction. Uh, apart from that, it's IV loading. It's uh, a straightforward drug to use. Its toxicity is almost entirely dose dependent. The higher the dose, the more likely you get double vision and clumsiness and nausea and so forth. So it's, it's relatively free of idiosyncratic side effects except for that cardiac swelling. So it is a useful drug. The trialing of glucosamide, I believe, for status is ongoing, but status trials are really hard to do due to a definition of standard of care. Uh, it is easier to use than dilantin or phenytone. Uh, 
I, I have no problem with it. I have a lot of people on it. It still remains a brand name drug. It still remains expensive. It's been out 10 years. It's likely to become generic in the next year or two. So I like the drug. It's a good choice for a lot of people. It's a better choice than phenytoin. And then a uh, second question for you, other neurologists and neurosurgeons in the room. Are we fooling ourselves in thinking that giving a loading dose at the induction of anesthesia is sufficient pre-surgical therapy given the time that it typically takes for some of these changes to uh, prophylaxis and seizures to take place? Should we be loading these patients outpatient 24 hours ahead of time on extended release uh, lab or something else? Uh, short answer is no. The uh, IV version of levetiracetam gets into the CNS extremely quickly. It's in there in about 25 minutes. Even the PO version actually gets in really quickly. So uh, I don't consider that much of an issue. Um, the issue sometimes comes when we're down there mapping. So we go down to the OR as part of the epilepsy team. Here's job is to figure out cortical functions for surgical uh, removal of, of eloquent sites. So we want to know where the edge of language is. We want to know where the motor regions are. And we'll go down and we'll stimulate. And in that circumstance, it's quite common while the surgeon is stimulating that we might elicit a seizure due to that uh, activity, in which case I typically will ask the anesthesiologist, well, how much caffeine do you give? And we'll dose intra-op, and by and large, most times we don't run into major issues with uh, the drug not getting in fast enough or not being available soon enough. So uh, I don't think you need to, to be more aggressive in the load uh, well before surgery. The, the, the other part to that question, Zach, that I think is particularly interesting from an uh, epilepsy point of view is what is the epilepsy risk when you actually open the dura and the brain mushrooms out? That, to me, is a red flag for someone who is going to be high risk longer term, regardless of the tumor type. It, the intervention there and then packing them up and making sure everything's good again, that's the sort of folk that I worry about. Uh, longer term. Jerome. Do you recommend weight-based loading and dosing in the adult patients? And then separately, we get tons of patients asking about cannabinoids and ketogenic diet. You know, yeah. we have data on them in other settings, you know, but when patients say, I don't want a new, I don't want a second drug, right. do you ever allow them as kind of an equivalent approach for patients like this? Yeah, so weight-based dosing, short answer, yes. and. Uh, Add to that, if they have a multi-organ issue, either renal or liver or both, be very careful on your loading dose. The, the second part, the CBD. So, man, if I had a dollar for every CBD question, <laughs> I wouldn't be here. <laughs> anyway, uh, so <laughs> Uncle Ike's selling it. <laughs> but, OK, so, 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 sh so the short answer there, and I'll stick, because I know there's another speaker next. The short answer, about one in five of our patients, in general, in epilepsy clinic, thinks that CBD oil or CBD supplements makes their seizure control better. If you look at that group six months from that initial reporting of how the CBD did, and ask them again, are you still on it? It's down to one in five again. So six months after trialing, we see about one in 25 patients still on it. So the, the over-the-counter versions of CBD oil aren't terribly effective for seizure. We're also seeing that in the Lennox Gasteau and Dravet kits that we treat with the pharmaceutical grade high-dose CBD oil. The study and the trial data was quite encouraging with these pretty good outcomes on ground wall seizures, but the kids we're using it on in real life, it's probably about one in three to one in four who actually have somewhat of a reduction. The other thing that's important about the data, the only good data on this comes from the Lennox, Gaston, and Dravet trials. The data only shows significant benefit for convulsive seizure. So anything milder and smaller, the CBD doesn't show much of a difference. So I, I have no problem with people using it. It's probably not going to hurt them. It does have at higher doses the number of tendencies to jack up medicine levels. And um, by and large, it may have other effects, inflammatory effects that are useful. But um, 
I, I, I just sort of do the caveat mTOR uh, approach on that one. Okay. Well, thank you all. Oh, I'm sorry. As far as anticonvulsants for these patients. And number two, when you say that they should have a, a form of benzodiazepine at home in case they have seizures, uh, I understand there's an injectable form. What do you think of that versus the under the tongue? Uh, I, we, I, in this day and age, there's a number of rapid dissolve formulations that can all be used in the mouth without necessarily having to swallow. Uh, there's also a new inhaled burst head uh, that also gets by that that's hard to get a hold of. But the injectable forms for most rational sane patients who are frightened in the midst of a seizure and to have a family member do it, there's only a handful I have who use uh, burst head uh, for a seizure abortion, but they're using it spraying into the nose, not injecting. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, the second one was lamotrigine, right? So lamotrigine or lamictal. Lamictal is a tricky drug to use in patients who need a good dose quickly. That's the main limitation in tumor patients. It takes about six weeks to get a therapeutic dose. If you go too quick, you run the risk of running into a hypersensitivity reaction. It is a good drug. Its side effects are relatively tame in most people. It does have a tendency to sharpen anxiety, as far as I'm concerned. So if you have an anxious, super nervous patient who's not sleeping, lamictal isn't a good choice. Which is like not music. Yeah, exactly. OK, anything else? Great. Great, thank you guys.